Hello and welcome to my channel, Michael's Heartfelt AI, A Writer's Journey. Today I'm uh, doing a reaction video for something that kind of scared me. It's uh, The Expanding Dark Forest and Generative AI by Maggie Appleton. And, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, I'm trying to start a new YouTube video and this, this made a very powerful argument that, well, no, maybe this is not going to work out for <laughs> content creation, that AI might destroy everything. I try to stay away from the gloom and doom videos about AI, but this one is specifically related to writing heartfelt, uh, in creative works with AI so uh, and it kind of scared me so I thought you know I may not have all the answers and 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 uh, this presenter really uh, enlightened me on a, a bunch of things and uh, made me think about lots of things uh, so uh, is it possible to have <laughs> Here we go. Let's dive into the content. So, uh, switching over to, uh, I wanted to show you. This is a video that was at FFConf in 2023. And if you look at it, it says FFConf is a full day of eight carefully curated sessions for an audience that cares about what the future of web, uh, the future of the web, and who want their ideas challenged. This video <laughs> really challenged me. Uh, so here we go. Let's let's take a look at it, and uh, we'll we'll talk about it some. Uh, hi, thank you, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to not tell you how AI is going to save us all. Uh, so yeah, this talk is called the Expanding Dark Forest in Generative AI. Um, it's going to be about writing on the web, trust, and human relationships. So like small fish. Um, and also AI, unfortunately, I'm sorry. There always has to be like one AI talk at every conference at this point, but at least you get me and not someone telling you how it's going to take all your jobs. Yeah, she's kind of apologetic about AI. I can relate to that because, you know, I went to Microsoft Ignite in Seattle and it was like AI, 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 <laughs> you know. Okay, yeah. Um, so I always give a footnote with this talk where I say, well, this talk is up to date as of about a week ago, as of about Monday. So anything that's happened since Monday, I can't take accountability for. It's probably all out of date by now, but this is, this is the state of the AI industry. Same. It's like everything I'm talking about AI all year long, it's been every week there's new stuff and it's just going so fast. So I can totally relate with that and I'm trying to figure out how that's going to influence my channel and all the things I'm I'm uh, talking about AI so far you know uh, I'm hoping to talk about some things that are timeless and not so much technology based but uh, let's go on so first some context uh, this is me I look like this on the internet my name is Maggie uh, I am a designer at an AI research lab called Elicit we do use language models to help um, scientists and researchers do literature review, which is a long, boring task, reading many thousands of PDFs. And this is something that language models are actually quite good at helping with. Um, I also am very online. I'm very on uh, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I write a lot online. And this has led to lots of really positive relationships, a lot of really good career success. And this will become relevant later as to why I care so much about people in the future being able to do that, to be able to write online and connect with others by writing online. Um, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to write and uh, connect with people online. And uh, so this is what this talk is about. And uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm not very online. I've got my YouTube channel and, you know, if you Google me, I, I come up and everything. But as far as... Uh, social media and stuff like that I'm, I'm not a power user but uh you know i've, I've visited them but uh she's got these excellent credentials here um really you know it makes me want to tune into everything she's saying here and i'm also a, a cultural anthropologist i originally trained in this for my undergraduate degree before becoming a designer because you can't get paid much to be a cultural anthropologist 
but a lot of the theory I learned there plays back into my thoughts on, on design and development and how we build things on the web. Um, so if you want, um, while you're doing this, if you want to take, take notes and things, you can also just scan this QR code and this whole talk is transcribed with slides and everything on this link. So don't worry about like taking pictures of slides you like or like trying to remember what I said. You can reference it later. I might have to update it a bit because the talk evolves, but one version that's mostly the same is on that QR code. Um, so yeah, here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, we're going to talk about the dark forest theory of the web. You know, what is that? Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the state of generative AI as of a week ago. Uh, I'm third going to present some problems, and then we can kind of talk about whether they actually are problems. We can question whether we think they're legitimate or not. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk about possible futures, so how to deal with all these hypothetical problems that I present. So first, to explain the dark forest theory of the web, I'm first going to have to explain the dark forest theory of the universe. So this is a theory that... Yeah, when I saw this video, I never heard of the dark, dark forest theory before. This is fascinating. ...tries to explain why we haven't found intelligent life in the universe. Right, here we are in the universe, the pale blue dot. Uh, and as far as we know, we are the only intelligent life around. Right? And we've been beaming out messages for like 60 years now with like SETI, uh, trying to find other intelligent life, trying to see if there are aliens or some other kind of being that could respond to us. And we haven't heard anything back. So the big question here is why? So dark forest theory says it's because the universe is like a dark forest at night. It's a place that seems quiet and lifeless because if you make noise, the predators come eat you. So if you draw attention to yourself, you're going to be attacked and destroyed. So it stands to reason that all the other intelligent civilizations that may or may not exist have either died or learned to shut up. And we don't know which one we are yet. <laughs> so the web version of this builds off this concept. It's a theory that was proposed by Yancey Strickler, who's a really good thinker and writer, back in 2019. Uh, and Yancey wrote this article describing what it feels like to be in public spaces on the web around this time. And Yancey pointed out these two main vibes, let's say. Uh, and the first is that being on the web often feels like a very lifeless, automated kind of place that's devoid of humans, right? It's got all this ads and clickbait and like predatory behaviors, and none of it feels like real humans are trying to connect with us on the web. It just feels commercial. Yeah, that's so scary. I mean, you know, in some ways, I've used the web less this year because I've been using ChatGPT so much, and uh, and yeah, that paints a really dark uh, picture for uh, starting a YouTube channel and uh, trying to bring authenticity into the into the web and the world of AI here. This is so scary. The second vibe. Oh, actually, well, here. Um, so here we are on the web, right? And we uh, are naively writing a bunch of very sincere, authentic accounts of our lives and thoughts and experiences. That's me. And trying to make uh, connections with other intelligent humans, right? We're sending out messages. Oh, to no, this is life. not going to be good. Um, but then what we hear in response is content that seems very inauthentic and human. It sounds like a bunch of robots and automations um, doing marketing automations and growth hacking, kind of pumping out generic clickbait. So we've seen all this stuff, right? This is like low quality listicles, right? Productivity rubbish, growth hacking advice, you know, banal motivational quotes, dramatic clickbait. Yep, like yep, yep. a lot of this may as well be automated even if a human did make it in some sense, right? They're rarely trying to communicate some sincere original thought to other humans. They're trying to get you to click, right? And, and rack up some views. Uh, and this flood of really low quality content has made us retreat away from the public spaces of the web. It's very costly for us to spend time and energy wading through all this craft. That's me. Um, you know, especially with ADD, it's like the summary feature of ChatGPT is my fight back against all the stuff to find out, you know, rather than read the whole article, give me the summary of it because there's just so much stuff, stuff out there and it's hard to sort through it all. So the second vibe of the dark web is that there's a lot of unnecessarily antagonistic behavior at a large scale. So when we are putting out all these signals, right, trying to authentically connect with other humans, uh, we could become a target, right? We risk the Twitter mob coming to eat us, is what can happen. 
So uh, there's a term on Twitter called getting main charactered. I don't know if people have heard of this. Uh, and I don't know if people remember, um, this is one year ago, Garden Lady. This was a very famous tweet, if everyone saw this one, where this really lovely woman got on Twitter one morning, and she said, my husband and I wake up every morning, and we bring our coffee out to the garden, and we sit and talk for hours, and it never gets old, and we never run out of things to talk about, and I love him so much. And everyone was like, that's such a nice tweet. That's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and then this went viral. They got picked up, uh, and the Twitter replies started rolling in. So someone said, that's cool. I wake up every morning and fight my way through traffic for an hour to in Miami to get to work. That must be nice. Uh, someone else, I wake up at 6 a.m., right? This is an unattainable goal for most people. Not that she said it was a goal, but, you know, interpret it as you will. Uh, another one, again, complaining about the morning routine, and then goes, it must be nice being a trust fund baby with not a care in the world. Um, <laughs> so I thought this TikTok summed it up nicely. I don't care if something good happened to you. It should have happened to me instead. <laughs> so this seems like a dumb example, but it was a really good moment on Twitter that shows kind of the energy flows that happen on these really large-scale social media platforms, right? Someone can publish something that's very kind and nice, and it gets interpreted the wrong way. People take it in bad faith. They take it out of context. They try to amplify it to unintended audiences. We will take every opportunity to misinterpret things and be ungenerous to each other. That is so scary. I mean... That's exactly what I don't want to happen on my channel. Uh, so I'm launching this channel, and <laughs> this is my very first video that I'm I'm making on my channel, and it, it's uh, right from the get-go. I'm facing this fear of you know releasing my channel uh, for authentic AI, and I'm thinking, oh, that's what's going to happen. You know, she's predicting my future that I'm stepping into this controversial topic that is just going to be so difficult to wrangle with. But here I am, I'm stepping onto the stage and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, being challenged by these thoughts and I'm, I'm trying to bring my, my best game here to, 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 to talk about this stuff. But that's so scary. Uh, <laughs> and this is how we get cancelings and pylons and we've all seen so many examples of this happening in what seems like a very unfair way. Um, John Ronson wrote an entire book about this called You've Been Publicly Shamed that catalogs quite a few of these. It's a little out of date now, but it's a lot of kind of classic original examples of people getting canceled, and then the real material consequences they face, right? They lose jobs, they lose friends, they are alienated from their community. It is not just internet drama. They really do have to face repercussions for these pylons. And so this makes a web, the web a very sincerely dangerous place to <laughs> sincerely publish your thoughts, to publish honest things on. I'm stepping in the danger. Uh, and this makes it hard to find people, right? It's very difficult to find people who are, who are being sincere, who are seeking coherence, and who are trying to build collective knowledge in public. And I'm hard to find. I know find. this is not what <laughs> everyone wants to do with the web, right? Like some people just want to dance on TikTok, and that's completely fine. We have to let them do that. Um, but I'm interested in at least some of the web enabling this kind of productive discourse and having spaces of community building. And I'm hoping some people here feel the same, right? Rather than it being like this threatening, inhuman place where you can't actually say what you think. Yes. So how do we cope with this, right? We're all wandering around this dark forest of like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and we realize we need to go somewhere safer. So what we end up doing is we retreat, primarily to what's being called the cozy web. So this was a term coined by Venkatesh Rao in direct response to the dark web theory. Um, and Venkat pointed out that we've all started going underground. We move into semi-private spaces like newsletters or personal websites where you're less at risk of attack. You're not on these big uh, platforms. You're on your own separate domain or you're on your own separate newsletter. So this gives us some safety. We can at least decide a little bit who reads it and understand our audience. Um, but we often retreat even further into gate, gate kept spaces like Slacks, WhatsApps, Discord, Signal groups, right? This is where we end up spending the most, most of our time and having real human relationships where we can express our ideas safely, right? So things that we say we know will be taken in good faith in these smaller groups. We can engage in real discussion. Yeah, that makes me wonder, you know, about the platform I'm choosing. I'm choosing YouTube. It's long, it's long form and I feel like long form is 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 the voice of authenticity because people get to know you when they have a chance to spend some time with you. 
but like here on uh you know discord you know I, i've you know logged in and stuff but i haven't been a power user where i'm actually talking with people on discord and interacting uh i've used slack um whatsapp snapchat you know it's yeah private chat groups maybe that's something to explore for authentic web but I don't know. I'm I'm still thinking I need to go with the YouTube uh, long form videos for now. I mean, this is a complex topic about AI authenticity and how do you, how do you bring it without you know having these ongoing dialogues that take time to unravel. Um, you know, may, but maybe I need to venture into some of those too. Um, but there's some problems here, right? Like none of this is indexable or searchable. It's very hard to include people who aren't already in the group. Um, and it hides collective knowledge in these private databases that are even hard for the users themselves to access. And also like... Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to change the world and you're hiding in the cozy web, how do you do that? You, it seems like, you know, I, I, I guess you don't, you just... I guess it depends on what your goals and objectives are. I mean, you know, my site is probably, I mean, one day, you know, it might be more monetary, but you got to, you know, where it is now, it just needs to be a labor of love because, you know, you know, that, that's the point of it. You know, if, if, if I just had a purely monetar monetary focus, then then yeah, may maybe Cozy Web has its advantages that way. Like I've heard Patreon is trying to just completely allow people to leave YouTube and and move over there where you can do all your videos and everything and have a more of a less a lesser fight with the algorithm, the AI algorithms over there and and uh, build your own kind of private following. You know, maybe that'll be a you know, more popular in the future. Good luck finding anything on Discord. Like, you'll never be able to use the search functionality in these apps. Um, so my current theory, sadly, <laughs> is that the dark forest is about to expand because we now have this thing called generative AI. So I'm sure everyone has mostly heard of this, but what I'm talking about specifically here is machine learning models and neural networks that can create content that before this point in history, only humans could make. Right? This is text, images, audio, and video that mimics human creations in a very compelling and believable way. Here are kind of the, some of the major foundational models that you might have heard of for different media types. Right? We have GPT-4 and Claude for text, Midjourney and Stable Diffusion for images. There's now video ones like Runway ML. Uh, and you might have heard some of the news that a lot of these models are now becoming multimodal, so they can do uh, text to image, image to text, audio to text, like you can kind of go any way you want um, with media here. And this is, of course, ChatGPT. I'm sure we've all seen a thousand screenshots of this at this point. We understand what it is. Um, but to recap, it's right, we know it can generate huge volumes of high quality text in seconds. And the outputs are indistinguishable from human made text. When we try to get people to guess what's ChatGPT and what's human, they often can't. Um, it's trained on a huge volume of text scraped primarily from the English-speaking web. Um, and this all sounds very simple, right? But it leads to many kind of complex and potentially useful behaviors, but it's very emergent. We don't really understand what's possible because of this capability yet. We can also now, of course, generate images, right? This is Midjourney, which is, uh, usually makes pretty beautiful, impressive stuff. Um, but so we... Yeah, I started using uh, just the Dolly to make some of my thumbnails for my YouTube channel and some of my artwork. We found that these like generative AI models are now very easy to use and very widely accessible, right? They don't require technical skills, they're incredibly cheap, and they're increasingly becoming a feature in existing software you already have access to, like Adobe or Photoshop or Notion. They're just becoming pervasive. But the product category that I'm most nervous about, not just like Notion generating a plan for you, uh, is what's being called content generators, mostly for content marketers. So I'm gonna pick on one product, but there are many. This one's called Blade. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, uh, someone sent me a link to, you know, three clicks and you can write your book, uh, uh, you know, to get, to get a book that you can publish. And I was like, really? And uh, I was gonna do kind of a, 
my, my first video about that, but you know, th this, this one, you know, this, whatever this is, this is very, very similar. Plays, um, and it creates articles and social media content for you, right? And half the time, who wouldn't want that? Who doesn't want more content on the internet? Um, and so I want to show you how this works. So you decide what kind of content you want to make, right? You can say a blog post or a newsletter or a bunch of Twitter posts. And I'm going to say I want to write a blog post. Uh, and you type in what you want to write about and your target audience and SEO keywords. So I've decided I want to write about why uh, plant-based meat is morally wrong, which I don't believe, but that sounds like good clickbait to me. Like someone's going to be like, yeah, I want to find out why that's bad. Um, you know, maybe I'm a company that has some financial interest in plant-based meats going badly. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and have this model write a little article for me. It lets me pick a title, which is a nice customization. And then it turns out 700 words, right? And this is now ready for me to hit publish, right? Or at least gives me some base to work off. Yeah, so what I was going to say in my, my other video about this other product that lets you write a novel is very similar to this. I mean, uh, you know, she's, she's painting the, the picture for the fearful element of, you know, this kind of, you know, unverifiable, possibly filled with uh, hallucinations thing is going to just flood across the internet. But if you want to write something heartfelt from the soul, uh, it's not going to be a tool like this. And, you know, when I say heartfelt from the soul, it doesn't have to be, you know, ushy gushy stuff. If you're even writing about, you know, plant-based meat or whatever, there is a way to write it where it is close to who you are and what you're about and very authentic, even if it's like a how-to or some kind of um, philosophical book, you know, it matters. Uh, and, you know, if, if someone uses a tool like this and they come to this page and they basically rewrite the whole article and make it their own, to me, that's, you know, authenticity, bringing their authenticity to this game. And that previous screen she showed just a second ago where you could, you know, click on the title that you would like to go with uh, for, you know, the arguments against plants, plant-based meat, uh, those little choices, you know, yeah, that's classic, you know, AI generates those, you choose them or whatever. But I, I think what, you know, the fear that she is espousing, I think, is also the education program that the world is going to go through. Because when people create this, I mean, if their point, if, if their desire is to just, you know, flood the market with with so much, you know, stuff that you, you can't find the forest for all the trees, then, yeah, that's going to be a hurtful use of, of AI um, and you know but if you want to climb out of there and be helpful I mean people are tempted to think oh now I can write this article and get all this stuff out there but I think what they're gonna learn they're gonna gain an education from using tools like these is that um, they don't have a sense of pride or ownership or or um, a connection with their material and so um, I, I think that's that's what you know it'll get worse but then I think people will educate themselves on what they need from what they write and what they share and what they read and there there'll be a, an education with AI that will see past this to where people might use this for a rough draft to get them started, but then, you know, they'll they'll go under white right quality stuff. That's me being my optimistic uh, take on it. Uh, and if I'm lobbying against plant-based meats, I could just generate a hundred of these, right, and like optimize them for Google SEO and publish them all at once, and like hard days advocacy done, right? The quality and truthfulness of what's written in here is very questionable. We'll get to problems with that later. Um, but the point is, this is super easy to do at scale, very cheaply. And it essentially murders Google search, right? Like, this just does away with SEO-optimized content, because anyone can publish this immediately. 
Uh, it gets even better at the end, like it prompts me to generate more content. So it's like, oh, you have this blog post, why not generate LinkedIn posts and tweets and YouTube scripts and everything. We're not just getting crappy Google articles, this is across every publishing platform. Uh, right, so there's tons of things to do this. There's like AI LinkedIn post generators, generate your next tweet, right, YouTube content on autopilot, just thousands of these tools are pouring out. So most of the examples I showed actually have a very simple architecture, right? You have a single input, like write me an article on plant-based meat, and you feed it into this big black mystery box of a language model, right? And we don't really understand totally what happens inside, but it gives you an output, right? Writes you an essay. But you can't really tweak what happened in the middle. You can edit the output, but you can't kind of pull the knobs on the actual language model itself, which isn't very... And that, that's something that, yeah, I was, I was describing, you know, the big black box, the mystery box of the language model, but the more and more I think about it, uh, the less and less mysterious it gets. I mean, yeah, people don't have uh, the, the cognitive ability to do input and output because of the complexity that's in there. But the complexity, but you know, what's in there is a lot of uh, weighted values that statistically and probabilistically add up to a calculation, like a calculator. And, you know, it's kind of a massive, you know, uh, thesaurus of concepts that is, everything's weighted. And then uh, it's like a democratic vote of all the words that have gone before, you know, these are the words that we would choose word by word next. And so when I started understanding it in those terms, yeah, I don't need to read through a quadrillion little bits and bytes to understand that, you know, it's adding up the probability of something. Um, and that made it a little bit less mysterious and a little bit less personified and a little bit more uh, calculated, which I, th I think everybody in the world is kind of, you know, maybe slowly moving to the concept of this being a tool instead of um, uh, an intelligence. But uh, she talks more about that later. Very sophisticated. We don't have a lot of control or transparency in what's happening. Um, but the industry has realized this is a problem, and we started building architectures that are much more flexible and powerful. So we now have a language model architecture where we take that same black box of the language model, but we give it access to external tools, right? We say, okay, now we're gonna tell it it can search the web through an API. We give it access to a calculator. We give it access to a code REPL and APIs. It's now getting a lot more capable, right? It can now look up, uh, it can do maths, you know? It can look up information that it thinks might not be right. It can double check its answers. Um, also, language models are usually quite forgetful. You might have found this. Chat GPT, after a long string, will forget what you said earlier on. We can now hook them up to long-term memory databases and have them reference things like many weeks or months in the past, which makes them... Yeah, like in Chat GPT and the dev day uh, that they had recently, they extended the context window so it's longer. But this is even another concept about long-term memory base that database that... Uh, that you know, I bet in 2024, it'll be more of a thing. And a lot more capable. Um, and we also found that they perform much better if you give them these cognitive prompts, like you tell it to do something, but then you say, you know, think about your answer, critique it, and then answer me again. And that actually improves the quality of the answer quite a lot. So that's often called chain of thought prompting, self-critique. It can observe what it knows and plan the next step. Yeah, and a lot of those things, they, they have complex names, you know, for those prompting things. But, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense, you know. Even we as humans, if you say, show me your chain of thought or show me this step by step, every step we create, we have to match it with all the other steps around it, and it makes our answer better. It's the same thing with, you know, weighted responses and word choices. If these word choices have to match these steps, it seems to make sense, yeah. The answer would be better and more accurate. And whereas if you know you didn't give your chain of thought, you just put an answer, then the word, the randomness of the words that get chosen between the democratic voting of the words and the and the random choice of words, yeah, you're not gonna get as good of good of an answer. 
And if you ask it to, you know, observe and plan, self-critique, yeah, those things naturally because of the increased number of associations that you're forcing it to make as it chooses the words, you know, statistically, you get better results. And so I used to think of that, oh, that's a mysterious thing that's coming out of the box. But if you think about it for a second, it makes total sense from a, from a, from a statistics point of view. And it's getting these more cognitive capacities by adding on these kind of extra, extra techniques. Um, so this is being called the agent architecture, right? You tell the language model to act like an agent. It, it an, ends up as being like the centralized brain, and you give it. You can say you can use any of these tools, and then it composes um, which tools it wants to use to achieve your goal. So it ends up being a chain like this, where you give it your goal, it'll like observe, it'll plan, it'll call a different tool, it'll observe, it'll plan. And we can actually do really complex, kind of scarily impressive things when we level up to these more sophisticated architectures. And actually, on Monday, OpenAI did this big dev day uh, talk. I don't know if people saw this. And they announced a new API called the Assistance API that makes all that stuff that I showed that used to require quite a lot of Python code and M kind of insider knowledge. And they're just making it super easy for everyone to now do. Yeah, so the Assistant API, uh, uh, the Assistant there that she just showed, that gives you all the functionality that she was talking about on the developer side, but also on, on the ChatGPT Plus side, and I, I don't know if it's on the free side or not, but uh, you can make GPTs over there that tap in a lot of those same things. So it's kind of like she's showing you the developer version, but there's also the <clears throat> the um, the ChatGPT um, general user base version as well that that I've been using a lot to, to make things. So I'm so appreciative of all these extra things that you can just now build in with your chat to make it even more helpful. I plan to talk about more of those things on my channel. Do this architecture where you're able to kind of run any function, call any API, all hooked up to their really powerful models. So we're about to enter this phase where this very capable agent architecture is becoming pervasive and widespread and might be the foundation of a lot of new tools being built. So we're sort of on the precipice of a really uh, unnerving moment, let's say. Because agent architectures, I think, means we're about to enter a stage of sharing the web with non-human agents, right? These agents are very different to what we've currently known as bots in the past, like a completely different architecture and set of capabilities. Um, they're going to have a lot more data on how realistic humans behave. and they're Yeah, and so, you know, here's the part of her talk where, you know, we're going down the rabbit hole of there is no way to see who's who anymore. And you have to just like, well, she'll get into it more, but it, it I think right there is where maybe um, Maggie and I depart a little bit because um, yeah, when you think about the positive ways that you can use um, AI, it's, it's not limited to the web sphere. Like, like for instance, um, I use the, the sous chef GPT to cook uh, a holiday meal and build my first ruse for the first time. And, and I interacted with uh, all these things. I got recipes and understandings and I got to quiz, you know, what is a roux and how does it work and how does it work for biscuits or gravy versus macaroni and cheese. And, and you know, the result was I prepared this big meal for my family and uh, got plenty of leftovers in the freezer that we'll have for a long time. There's a positive use of AI and I used one of these little agent things. And, and I, I think part of this whole discussion has to do with um, where is your focus? And if your focus is on um, you know, all the the things that are going to go wrong and those things may go wrong, you know, then, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot more fear there. But I'm noticing that there are so many things that can go right and, and, and beneficial with AI that 
um, the, the conversation is just so much bigger with the ways that are, people are being helped. And, um, you know, we, we could do a whole other talk on all the ways people are being helped. And I mean, you know, you know, she already made a comment about that, you know, about that being like a, a replacement narrative for, for humans. But, but me being able to cook a dinner for my family that I otherwise wouldn't have the skill or knowledge or know how to make uh, yesterday, that's, that's, that's a positive. Uh, I, I, I have trouble seeing the negative on that one. Um, but anyways, uh, I don't want to let that keep me from at least exploring all these thoughts and angles that she's presenting here. They're rapidly going to get more and more capable as time goes on. And soon, probably already now, we're not going to be able to tell the difference between these agents and real humans. If anyone else spends a lot of time on Twitter slash X, you'll already have noticed there's a lot of accounts you stumble across that like have a weird vibe to them. And you definitely realize this is just like chat GPT hooked up to a Twitter account. But otherwise, it's trying to look real. But like every tweet, it's very optimized and comes back in like a second. It's just replying to things you know, three seconds later. Uh, so it's happening. And sharing the web, I want to say with agents, I don't want to jump to saying this is like inherently bad. I think they could have lots of good use cases. right? We could have automated moderators in communities. We could have search assistants. But I think it's mostly that it's going to get complicated, and this is going to be a huge product and cultural problem we're going to need to think about carefully and deal with. So we should get into why is this a problem for the web, right? Um, I'm only going to focus on how this will affect human relationships and information quality on the web. Anything else, like how we might all end up unemployed or dead soon, is like well beyond my pay grade. So I'm just limiting the space to just like how do we make meaningful human connections and find a good quality content on the web. Because yeah, the cost of creating and publishing content just dropped to almost zero at this point. Um, right? Like humans uh, are quite expensive and slow at making content, right? We need time to research and think, and we like clumsily string words together, and then we want to take breaks, and we want to be able to nap and eat and sleep. Um, and then we demand people pay us like extraordinary rates, right, to do to do this research. Um, and generative models uh, don't need time off, and they don't get bored, and they cost like a couple fractions of a cent to write a few thousand words. So given uh, the dynamics here, it's very likely that models are going to become the main generators of content online. So I think we're about to drown in a sea of informational garbage. Right? I think we're just going to be absolutely swamped in masses of mediocre content. Like every marketer and SEO strategist and optimizer bro is just going to have a field day here, you know, just filling the whole internet with all of their keyword stuff to optimize crap. And this explosion of noise is going to make it really difficult to find both good quality people. Real yeah, I mean, so she, she just power punched both the two fears there. One is, you know, we're going to be replaced with uh, workers that are a fraction of a cent. And then also that we're going to drown in this sea of content that we, we don't even know uh, how the internet's going to be useful anymore. <laughs> Real people and good quality content and hear any signal through the noise. And we can tell this is happening because spammers and scammers are currently quite lazy and we're kind of in the baby phases of this. So uh, there's a phrase that you might have seen ChatGPT reply with. It sometimes says, as an AI language model, I do not have political beliefs, or as an AI language model, I cannot answer that question. Uh, and this phrase, if you search in direct quotes for it around the web, shows up everywhere. Just like Amazon, Google, Yelp reviews, tweets, LinkedIn posts, it's full of this phrase. Because people can't be bothered to like control F and like delete the one phrase that gives them away. <laughs> All right. So I did a quick search for this on LinkedIn. It got 16,000 hits. And they're like really boring attempts to like write engaging content, but they all begin with the phrase as an AI language model, like in the first sentence. <laughs> and these are real people too. I did look at their profiles. They genuinely have jobs and they're trying to optimize their presence or something. Um, but yeah, this is, this is starting to happen. Um, the motivation for doing this, right, isn't hard to understand. So let's like think of the uh, hypothetical scenario. So uh, yeah, it's, it's completely not hard to understand. I mean, there, there's a pressure to to engage and to accomplish and to do more and um, and 
you know, you can use AI and do a lot more, but then you're going to make mistakes just like as a, you know, copy and paste mistakes. I'm so scared of making those copy and paste mistakes when I interact with people and I've, I've used AI to help me uh, generate content and stuff. I think it's so important to review what you have, but I can totally empathize with why people make mistakes like this. I'm, she's probably going to say something about it here. Uh, this is Nigel. He's written a book uh, about why nepotism is great, right? And he wants to be a book influencer. He's like, it's his first book. He self-published it on Amazon. He wants to like, you know, become a big book guy. So he spins up an agent, right? Not unlike a, an actual publishing agent he might have hired in the past. And he says, hey, like, help me, help me promote my book, you know? Um, and so the, uh, the agent thinks for a while, and it goes off, and it strategizes, uh, and it ge generates a steady stream of tweets, right, based about on the content of the book, like real insights from the book. And it starts tweeting those out from Nigel's account. He's given it access, you know? Uh, and it goes and it does the same thing for LinkedIn and Facebook, you know, pretty easy. Um, and then it, it writes and schedules a newsletter to go out over the course of six months so that his followers will always kind of get updates on new things he's researching. It sets up a Medium account. It reposts those as articles, right? Makes a set of addictive TikTok videos based on that content. Generates a bunch of podcast episodes that use Nigel's voice. We can totally do that now. It's pretty, uh, pretty easy. Uh, and then it finds a bunch of other people who like are talking about nepotism and starts replying to them on LinkedIn and Twitter and making friends. Maybe they are actually agents interacting with it. And like, it's a whole bunch of just <laughs> um, agents interacting with agents. Uh, oh wow! Just imagining that all that would be automated. Yeah, it makes you really wonder, you know, what what the quality is going to be of all that stuff for one thing. But then, yeah, it, it's one thing if, if you went and did all those things. This is a different thing if things are happening and you don't even know about it. That's That would be weirdo. <laughs> And none of this is different to what Nigel could do on his own. So we don't know that like content moderation or like um, spam spam filters are actually going to pick this stuff up because maybe it's you know tweeting it slow enough that a human could have done it. And it really is in Nigel's voice. It's used his writing to write this content. We don't necessarily have automated ways to filter any of this out. Um, and the thing is, like, without an agent, you know, 99% of Nigel type people wouldn't have gone to all this effort. They don't have the time and energy to have made all this content. But with the agent, you know, suddenly we have uh, people like Nigel, but like times 99 of them, able to create this amount of content all the time. And this is how we kind of get the flood of just tons of content, more than we can. And that's, you know, that's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, you know, like if you look at somebody who has a disability, uh, like, I'm, I keep talking about my ADD, or if you have dyslexia, or if you have any of these cognitive issues, and you're all of a sudden you're augmented so that, you know, you weren't a part of the conversation before, but now that you can generate, you're entering into the conversation for the first time. It's like the equity in the whole sphere of the world and what's possible shifted. And yeah, there's going to be this high end, you know, population of people who, um, you know, are, you know, AI has just gone, you know, rogue and tried to augment them in ways that might be nonsensical and, you know, and, and not have that level of authenticity that all of us would benefit from and like. But this same concept that she's sharing right now is, is bringing people who haven't even been able to participate into the sphere. And that's a whole other conversation, you know. I don't know that we should assume that everybody is just throwing out meaningless uh, content uh, on a scale that, you know, is, I, I mean, they're going to do that, but there are people who are entering into our sphere, and I think we need to be welcoming of people who have been prohibited from entering into this sphere and actually doing it. 
and you know and it's not clear cut i mean there there are cases where you know people who don't even care about their content at all are going to be producing massive amounts of content but there are going to be people who have a voice for the first time in their life because of ai and they're going to be coming onto the stage and uh, we shouldn't throw those people out with the people who really, you know, just clicked a few buttons and don't really care about their content. Because, it, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem, but, but for many people, you know, this is, this is a good thing. And it's going to bring a diversity to our content that we've never seen before in many cases, too, I think. So that's something to watch out for, you know. Maybe most of these characters on her screen right here are all, you know, uh, mostly people who just went and clicked on something. But there's a percentage of these people that actually want to bring authentic content and and they are being championed with, uh, with, uh, with augmentation of AI in ways that um, will make the world a better place. Uh, but anyways, just I, I wanted to add that perspective while it, while this screen was flying by here. Can really um, cope with. So the scale and the quality of the content is actually what's different here. I mean, strangely enough, it might have written better stuff than Nigel ever would. We might have like way better quality content about nepotism all over the internet. Um, but like you can imagine how this would play out at another hundred x scale, right? With political lobbying groups who have very vested interests in certain ideas or beliefs or truths getting out into the world, specific agendas, you know, uh, large companies that want you to believe certain things about their product or certain things about scientific claims. Uh, they all have access to these assistants and agents too. So I do have some good news, like this has all been a bit dark, a bit of a downer. Uh, the good news is uh, that this might not be a problem. Maybe this is, this is all just fine, right? Uh, this is only a problem if we want to use the web for very particular purposes such as like facilitating genuine human relationships or like pursuing collective sense making and knowledge building or like grounding our knowledge of the world in reality. So like. And AI can help with um, connecting uh, humans. Um, and to some degree pursuing collective sense making Um, and it's not perfect, but yeah, grounding our knowledge in reality. It's not all or nothing. That's all I'm saying. She's got valid points here, but it's not all or nothing. There, there's AI helping with these things, but there's AI harming these things too. And, you know, I'm trying that 3H model on my channel with, you know, hurtful AI, <laughs> um, helpful AI and heartfelt AI. Um, yeah, yeah, to all, it, it's all there. It, it's, it's just not all or nothing, you know. They say, you know, the truth is, the more complicated your truth is, probably the more accurate it is. So that's something to watch out for here. But yeah, she's got valid points. <laughs> if we don't care about any of these things, this is all fine. Uh, like, we're going to have amazing content on TikTok. We're going to be very entertained. Um, the thing is, like, I'm quite keen on a lot of these outcomes, right? I write on the web a lot. I've had overwhelmingly positive experiences writing on the web and meeting people through doing that. Um, I really I have this whole thing called digital gardening I bang on about, about making everyone publish their kind of unfinished notes to the web and improve them over time and use that as a way to meet people interested in what you're interested in. Um, but yeah, the goal of that stuff is to make the space, you know, the web a space where that's possible for collective understanding and knowledge building. Uh, and I'm really worried that generative agents like meaningfully threaten this in the very near term, like the six to 12 month kind of time range. Like I can't even think beyond that. Um, so when I talk to people about my worries, I talk to a lot of people in the AI safety and AI research world. So they kind of go like, well, why does it matter? Like, you know, my AI agent is going to make much better content than you ever would. Like, why do you care that an agent made it and not a human? I don't think that's true. I think people are still going to make better, better content, ultimately. I mean, 
and especially if they use AI in an augmentative way, their content is going to be even better um, from a human sense of reality. But yeah, she's probably going to make a similar point. Human. And they're like, okay, let's like engage with that question properly. Um, I'm sympathetic to that point. Um, so here's the reasons that generated content is a little bit different, right? The first is its connection to reality. The second is the social context they live within. And the third is its potential for human relationships. And I'm going to go into each of these in detail. So first, generated content, you probably have heard of this, is different because it has a different relationship to reality than we do, right? We are embodied humans, right? And we are sharing a physical reality. And we have all this like rich embodied information, like we all understand we're in this kind of beautiful theater and we're in Brighton and we have a lot of physical embodied context about what we know about each other. Um, and often what we're doing on the web, right, is we're reading other people's accounts of this reality and we compare it against our own and we're like, huh, do I agree with that? Is that really true? Right, this is like the cycle of all of like art and science and literature, you know? Reading and comparing and writing your own version of things. And what we've done now is we've fed that huge trove of information into a, a neural network or a large language model. Um, and it's created a sort of representation of that text, right? It's created a model of the things that we've already known about the world and have published to the web. Um, and the thing is that model can now generate text that's predictably similar to what it was before, but it's totally unhinged from the physical reality that it once came from, right? It has some vague connection. It did come from there. There's like a, a chain here, but it fully like cannot access that reality, right? Okay, so like, like right here, <coughs> you know, she just briefly said that, yeah, it does have some relationship, but you know, part of this is how you choose to feel to think about it um in some sense when you get this generated text it's like word by word all the writers throughout history that have been fed into the model have had a little vote for each word that gets sent back to you based on the specific uh, uh topics that you're drawing the attention of the model to to the context that you're feeding in and in one way you know she put the word unhinged on there but in another way we're talking with our ancestors throughout time and history and you know one of the things that we see in our generated text as it follows the patterns of everything that you know it's read and everything that's been written throughout history is this profound thing that people have been trying to help other people <laughs> through what they wrote and now you know from books that I'll never read and websites I'll never visited where people tried to help other people I'm getting a derivative work where all those people are collectively voting one word at a time the text that gets generated that comes back and it's like the people of, of history are speaking to us in a way and you know what the pattern is they try to help other people and that's a beautiful thing and yes the text generated does have many unhinged properties about it and uh, I have a feeling she'll zoom in, zoom in on that with some valid points. But I also wanted to just give that other feeling that you can have about this little cycle that she's drawing here. Yes, it doesn't loop all the way back, but it does loop back in some ways that gives us access to that. And I'll probably mention it again later, but you know, being able to write something that gets put into this generation cycle uh, means that we'll have the ability to influence the next generation with what text gets generated, even if they don't read specifically what we wrote. And so this is also on the screen a map of how in some small, tiny way we can give back and continue the tradition of trying to help other people with our writing 
and somehow that'll trickle down uh, to the people who see the generated text of the future. And what we write reinforces the patterns of the model if it gets fed in. And a lot of people protect their work. We'll talk about that later, but I'm just pointing out on this screen, it, it feels bad to, to see this unhinged relationship, but there's also uh, positive ways to think about this particular uh, topic, about how we're uh, able to kind of speak with our ancestors in some strange way because of a sci-fi technology that's just erupted onto the scene. And if you've ever used the generated text for therapy or to work through a difficult life situation, man, there's a lot, a lot of relevancy that's coming from what people wrote to try to help other people. Even if you, we put it robots, right, with like arms and eyes and ears, it can't sense the world the way we sense the world until we make like a fully synthetic, like mimicry human that like is hooked up to a language model. But I think we're like 10 years away. I don't know. I think we have some time. <laughs> Completely agree. <laughs> right, yeah. it can't validate its claims is the big thing. Um, we politely call this hallucination, right? This is when language models say things that aren't true about the world. We say it's hallucinating, right? Like it's some side kind of very smart person on some like mild drugs who's confused about like who they are or where they are, but they're saying very intelligent things. You're sort of holding them lightly, you know? Um, language models are also different because they have a very different social context, right? They have a very strange relationship to our social world. Um, so hopefully you know this, but everything you and I say is situated in a social context, right? We understand what we share in common, and if you met someone who spoke a different language from a different culture, you would not assume they thought the same things about the world that you would if you met someone from your own neighborhood, um, right? If one of us met someone from like Dickensian England, we would have very different understandings of like hygiene and science and like how the world works. We would know some things in common, we technically speak the same language, but we would know that we didn't have a shared social context in the same way. Um, but a language model is not a person, and it does not have a fixed reality, right? They know nothing about the cultural context of who they're talking to. And they take on different characters depending on what you tell them to do. You can say, you know, pretend to be a professor, um, pretend to be an athlete, pretend to be a young child, and it will take on that character. So it doesn't even have a fixed place it's talking to you from in the way that a human does. Yeah. That that's a lot of fascinating ways to look at it, but it, it feels reductive in the way she's saying that because, you know, the reverse is also true. Like if I turn to a language model to, to understand um, things outside of my culture, I can learn things that I, I would not know uh, just in the social context that I have. And in, in some ways, even though it's biased towards, you know, English and English speakers and stuff like that, um, that bias is, is less biased than I am because I'm like, you know, in a very specific niche, niche, uh, in a very specific subculture of a specific upbringing of a certain uh, uh, Chinese American mixed marriage kind of thing. I'm very specific, and and when I ask about India or Bangladesh or the languages spoken and things, and I get back these answers, and I and I and I challenge and say to a language model, well, tell me the opposite view, or tell me the other views, or tell me um, what how people would disagree with this. I can get the whole other perspective and the whole other social context because of just the awareness that it has from all the different um, uh, things that are in there that are just beyond me. I mean, I, I know that it's biased in some ways towards cultures, but also it's, it's bias. Uh, you know, I, I can't say that that I would know to have cultural sensitivity and and awareness of social context beyond mine and, and the way that it keeps giving to me. Uh, 
I hope that makes sense, but I don't want this video to go on forever, but let me, let me just keep going here. But they do represent a very particular way of seeing the world because we trained them primarily on text on the web that was generated by a majority English speaking, um, set, like 95% of the training data is English speaking, um, a primarily English speaking westernized population. Uh, people who have mostly written a lot on Reddit and lived between about 1900 and 2023, which like in the grand scheme of history and geography is a very narrow slice of humanity, right? Of all possible cultures we've had in the past and all possible cultures we've had in the, we could have in the future and all possible languages, this is just such a small representation of reality and yet we're now making it the source of truth, right? The oracle. You go to chat GPT to ask everything. Um, so it's taking this already dominant way of seeing the world and reinforcing that dominance. Yeah, I want to agree with everything she says and then also disagree at the same time. I mean, it, 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 it you know, I don't know. I already talked about this, but yeah, I mean, I imagine, you know, books from all the religious texts of the world are in there. Um, those, a lot of those probably predate 1900. And you know, before printing press, it's it's harder harder to get those texts in here. But yeah, okay, enough said on that. Which is problematic, and is like a whole different talk that I don't even think I'm like qualified to do, but someone should. Um, and we hope that this will improve over time. But it's really hard to do without lots of data. And most cultures don't have the vast kind of written record that an English-speaking Westernized online in population does. So lastly, uh, generated content lacks the potential for human relationships that human-made content does, right? If you write something online and I read it and I find it compelling, I can DM you on Twitter or I can find you on Blue Sky or I could find you somehow, ideally, hopefully not on LinkedIn, but somehow, and message you and be like, I love this. This was such good ideas. Like, I want to write a piece in response to you and like, we start having a little dialogue. I've had so many... <laughs> what I'm doing right now, uh, reaching out uh, to do a response piece here. Relationships blossom this way. Um, but if you have a language model, it's not going to be able to do that. Um, so this is a still from the film Her, right? This has become kind of a cultural touch point of like parasocial relationships with, with AI. Um, hopefully people have seen it, but if not, so Joaquin Phoenix, our lovely main character, he has this great relationship with his personal AI, he talks to her in his ear. Um, it falls in love with her, but then the AI, of course, grows bored of him because he's a very kind of basic human and leaves and he's distraught. And like, uh, some people were supposed to get this, like, film is supposed to be a warning, right? Uh, and some people took it as a suggestion. Um, so <laughs> there's a company called Replica um, who make AI companions for you that you can. Uh, make friends with, possibly date and fall in love with. There's a lot of suggestions of sort of lonely young men engaging with this and their marketing copy. Um, and I mean, maybe I do need to explicitly point this out. Uh, an AI replica or any other kind of like generative agent person cannot fulfill all our human needs, right? They cannot give you a hug. They cannot come to your birthday party. They cannot kind of engage with you in a meaningful, full human way. Yeah, and, and part of that is like, you know, if you look at it from, you know, the ultimate perfective kind of a way, um, yeah, no, it doesn't do that. But if you look at it from a weakness perspective where, you know, you are living with unmet needs and you don't know how to interact with society or other people and you use a tool like this and you you gain confidence and relational skills to help you form relationships in the real world. I think that's where this this kind of a tool could shine. I mean, I know Replica was kind of monetized and it had like a sexual component and then a Valentine's Day massacre where all the replicas got a kind of a lobotomy as far as uh, the sexual parts of the relationships and everything, but, and then it kind of evolved after that and there's a lot of drama there who a lot of people felt a lot of hurt and pain uh, from uh, that change in the AI and also uh, you know there there are people who but, but you know in general though 
there are success stories of, of people who've used this technology and they've uh, been it's enabled them to step out into the world and form relationships where uh, they, they just didn't have the social skills I mean like during COVID we all lost a lot of our social skills um, but you know getting those back that's meaningful and there's lots of testimonies around that um, and so any kind of language model agent on the internet has no capacity for, for that back and forth relationship. Even if it faked it, it's very unclear that would actually satisfy what we need when we have an actual friend that we can go out to coffee with. So that all sounds quite bad again, like deep breath. The whole talk is really just digging you in a ditch, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm now going to talk about possible futures. And again, these futures I think are... Uh, not mutually exclusive, I think they all might unfold in different ways over the next five to ten years. And like, I can't speculate beyond that, God knows where we are. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping they all kind of happen in parallel. So the first is I think we're about to spend a lot of time thinking about how we pass the reverse Turing test. So how do we prove we're human on a web filled with agents? So the original Turing test, right, you have a human talk to a computer and another human through like a, a wall so they can't see the typing messages of each other. Uh, and in the original test, the computer had to prove that it was the human. It had to prove it was competent. Uh, and on the new web, we are now the ones under scrutiny, right? Re we have to prove we're real. So um, we're going to end up way. like we will assume everyone is an agent until proven otherwise. So I kind of wrote this post where I was thinking about some short-term tactics. Like we could use funny terminology. We could all try to become teenagers who like have this insider jargon that the language models don't know about, but they'll pick up on it pretty quick, you know, and then you'll have to abandon it, get new jargon. Uh, we could write in non-dominant languages. If you speak something like Catalan or Welsh, you're probably in a pretty good position. You know, you'll be able to write in a way that's more native than a language model ever could. Um, and ideally, we just do higher quality writing. We do more research. We do more critical thinking. We really reference um, events and people that could, we could only know about from the real world, from being embodied humans in space. I don't know how long those kind of defenses will last, but that's, in the short term, something we can at least pull on. Uh, this next one, I apologize for the phrase, but it too perfectly captures the point. I'm not going to explain it. You can Google that later. Um, but the point <laughs> is that the content from models might end up... Uh, I did Google that. I'm going to no comment on that one. <laughs> you probably don't want to Google it. Coming all source of truth. Um, and that how we know things simply was like, well, a language model once said it. You know? And then it's forever captured in our circular flow of information. So right, in this current model, right, the training data is at least based on real-world experiences. It's kind of going in a, in a single loop. Um, but we're now going to use that generated text um, to train new models. And so we enter this loop where like, there's this very tenuous link to the real world that was once a long time ago the source of this data. This is already starting to happen. Um, AI researchers are worried we're kind of going to run out of data to train models on within five years. And so there's a lot of talk of how do we generate information that we can feed the models, feed back into the models. Um, yeah, I'll mention something else there that it made me think of. Uh, you, uh, I was at Microsoft at night, and one of the closing things they had in the closing keynote uh, was this idea that they were developing a technology to help large language models forget. And they gave an example where they they taught the language model to forget all about Harry Potter because otherwise you'd say, who is Harry? And it would instantly tell you about Hermione and Ron and Harry and Hogwarts. But they ran this against the model and then all of a sudden Harry was just another name and there was no such thing as, as Harry Potter anymore. That's kind of scary in its own way, but it, it makes me think that, you know, in the future, LLMs may be more malleable, and these things that she's bringing up here may be solvable problems, like, uh, you know, like this problem she's bringing up here. Maybe, you know, there'll be ways to modify LLMs and they won't just be stuck knowing what they know. This one was a really funny example of this happening. I don't know if people saw this. So someone noticed that if you ask Google if you can melt an egg, it's like smart AI summary said yes. And they were like, why would it say that? They went investigating. And it turned out that fact was pulled from Quora that was generated from ChatGPT. Um, and because Quora is considered a, a reputable website with good SEO standing, it got pulled up into the Google like smart answer. 
Um, and it's not hard to imagine how all kinds of hallucinated answers are going to become part of this loop if all these major websites are using ChatGPT or their own agent to generate answers, and then they just feed it to each other. It's like, at one point, is, can you melt an egg, you know? Um, this phenomenon is very worrying for the scientific community, and they have good reason to be. We're already seeing a lot of evidence that scientific researchers are using language models to help them write papers. Um, so again, <laughs> this is a paper that was published in a genuine, fairly legitimate journal, uh, Environmental Science and Pollution Research, uh, and it included the phrase, regenerate response, at the end of a paragraph, which is the button above ChatGPT's input box. There was another one in August that was published on fossil fuel allocation that included the phrase, as an AI language model. Um, now, <laughs> there's a lot of debate in the community where they were like, well, this doesn't mean the science in these papers is totally false, right? They could have done real research on real experiments, and they were just trying to get this paper out, and at the end they went, you know what, ChatGPT summarizes this paragraph for me. That totally could have happened. But the problem is we don't know. There's no protocol for the transparency of how you say what you did and didn't use ChatGPT or whatever kind of model for. And that, that phrase right there, there is no way to, to know, that scares me. I mean, you know, someone told me, you better not tell anybody that you use AI to help write your, your, your novel. Keep that close to the vest because, um, you know, <laughs> that's one of the reasons. People don't know, maybe they think you're just clicking and, and AI is writing for you, or maybe you're writing something legit. You know, we, we haven't even really developed the language to start to address that problem yet. And I think, you know, yeah, she's talking about the debate, you know, is there some legitimacy in this paper or was it just all fluff? And I don't think it's all or nothing. Um, it, it can be both and it can be augmented and uh, I think that's the way with writing as well um, and I mean that's my philosophy is is use AI to augment your writing um, not just to uh, replace your writing and and and, and that, that you know that gets back to the whole uh, you know hurtful helpful heartfelt thing you know maybe that's beginning to have the language of just describing how do you use AI when you write something, I think we'll maybe develop that language over time, hopefully, so that we do have a way to talk about this in a, in a meaningful way when it comes to generating work and knowing how much of it is subject to the AI corruptive influence versus the AI augmented influence. Um, so now people are trying to make it more legitimate. Some people are listing ChatGPT as an author on papers. Um, and there's a real risk that like, people with much worse intentions will kind of take this and run with it, right, and just make scientific paper mills. You know, there's a lot of companies that have a lot of vested interest in publishing science that you know, uh, agree with the thing that they would like to be true. Usually you find this out when you get to the funding source section of the paper, where you're like, oh yeah, funded by the people who make this drug, interesting. Um, but you can tell that if they're going to be able to use generative models to kind of pump out lots of research papers, maybe based on dubious science, it becomes very hard for us to tell what is actually real, what is vetted. I mean, it just takes the whole the replication crisis to a whole new level. Um, so this one seems the most obvious, right? Um, one possible future is we will just retreat further into the cozy web, right? The dark frost will grow larger, and we will just go, okay, I'm only interacting with Discord and WhatsApp. Right, LinkedIn's dead, Twitter's dead, is just, we've had to abandon it. We have to maybe make new privatized gate-kept spaces, which I think has a lot of downsides, but this just might be the best way to deal with it. Um, I think authors are gonna increasingly put content behind blocks and paywalls. I think this is already happening with things like Substack and Medium, where you're constantly having to like log in or, or prove that you are part of this community to access the content. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of questioning that the way a lot of places are doing that. I mean, on the one hand, I get it, but on the other hand, um, like I said earlier, uh, if I had content, I, I want it to be available to help as many people as possible. And, and also, even if it's used in a training model, 
I want that training model to be more powerful and effective for the next generation as well. Um, anyways. Um, and you understand why authors do this, right? Because actually, you having your content scraped and then fed into generative models puts you in a disadvantage. Like, your ideas could be taken out of, con out of context. Maybe it's taken something that you wanted to actually charge for and given out for free. Um, someone could train a model on your work and have it start writing in your voice. There's a lot of ways this can go really badly for someone whose full-time job is being a researcher or a content creator. Yeah, huge economy and how do you earn a living disruptions on the way. But I'm, I'm thinking they're solvable problems. And, you know, if, if the money problem gets solved and people have... And, and that's that's taken off the table, then, you know, yeah. I'm not sure where that leave, leaves this reasoning for making a paywall or guarding your work so, so closely. Um, you'll we'll also see more websites that have a large amount of content blocking scraping for, for language models um, or one way to do it is to just charge a huge amount for your API. So Reddit did this recently. They just were just like, we're going to put the price so high that like no company in their right mind would really pay it, or it would just cost them so much. And Twitter kind of did the same. It's hard to tell if this was actually strategic or like on purpose, but you know, raising the price to whatever it was, like 42,000 per month, means that very few people can access Twitter's you know really high quality content in an age where content to train models is like really kind of the new goals. Um, so it's, it's kind of leading us to a place where the web's not open by default. You can't just query any API for any content you want. Everything is locked down and gate kept and kind of cordoned off. Okay, next, I think we're going to have what I'm calling the meat space premium. Um, so this is, we are in the meat space premium. Uh, it's when we begin to prefer and preference offline first interactions. Um, so we will start to doubt all people online. And the only way to confirm someone's humanity is to, is to meet them in person, right? To go for coffee or beer. And once you do that, you can kind of set up a little trust network, right? You can say, oh, I've, I've already met Sarah over there, and she's a real human, and you've already met Tom, and he's a real human, and we can kind of like coordinate our networks to, to vet who's real on the web. And then when you read their writing, you kind of know it's from, from an actual person. Well, you'd hope so. You maybe have some trust network of people who aren't writing generated stuff under their own name. Uh, I think this has knock-on effects. Like people might move back to cities or higher population and places. In-person events are going to be preferable. I think there's obvious disadvantages to this, right? The web was this huge democratization thing to enable people who are maybe disabled or have young children or who are caregivers who can't get out of the house for a whole bunch of reasons aren't going to have the same access to the trust network that someone can who could physically show up in space a lot. Um, yeah. So a natural follow-on from this also. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm not going to comment on that. So a lot of people have been like, well, why don't we just put it on the blockchain, you know? Um, why don't we just get a third party to, like, verify our humanity with, like, a cryptographic key, and then you can, like, sign all your published content with it, and it'll link back to your identity, and, like, this is how we'll have, like, decentralized trust networks. And I'm like, okay, I don't know the details of this. This sounds weird. Um, so there's a project called WorldCoin that, funnily enough, is also funded by OpenAI's uh, leader, Sam Altman. He partially helped found it, which shows he kind of knows the problem he's helped contribute to. Um, so this scary orb scans your eyeball to confirm your identity, and then it creates a, like, a unique human credential for you to use online to sign all your stuff with. It's really not taking off as a project, but it's around. And people are still trying to do this. There's a whole community thinking this is the future um, that I don't have sophisticated thoughts on yet, and I'm still like, oh, it's cryptocurrency. But like maybe this is some way to get around it. Um, yeah, it's interesting all the things that Sam Altman and his company, you know, there's there's that identity world ID thing. There's the the neural chips that he invested in. There's the the research on UVI, uh, universal basic income, and um, probably some more things. But it's like they know what they're building and how it's going to disrupt the future. And they're also, you know, investing in places where they they see the world changing. It's a very interesting. I'm also expecting any day that Elon's going to announce the purple check, where you like pay $30 a month and you don't actually have to, you just tick a box that's like, I'm human, and then you get this little check, and like, it's all good. 
so those are all a bit negative. I do think there is some hope in this future. We can certainly fight fire with fire. So I think it's reasonable to assume that we're all going to have a set of personal language models who kind of help defend us and serve our needs on the web. Um, they can filter information. They can manage information. Um, and I expect these to be baked into browsers or maybe even the operating system. right? And they're going to do things like identify generated content. They're going to debunk claims. They're going to flag misinformation. They're going to go help hunt down real scientific sources for you, maybe vet scientific papers, curate and suggest things to you. So I think this actually could work in both directions. It's not just all like the bad actors get this power. We also get a lot of capacity and capability from these models. Yeah. We might find it absurd that anyone br would browse like the raw web without one of these uh, kind of in tow. It's the same way you wouldn't like go onto the dark web, like you know what's there, but you know you don't want to see it. It might be kind of like that. OK, so I'm almost done. I'm wrapping this up. Um, but the question I want to leave everyone with is which of these possible futures would you like to make happen, right? Generative AI is not necessarily a destructive force. You know, As with all technology, it depends how you wield it. Oh, I went back to the wrong slide. Sorry. Where were we? There we go. Um, the way that we choose to deploy this in the world is really what matters, right? The product decisions we make as individuals or companies, if you are working in the space or you're trying to get into it. Um, because obviously, if you are working on a tool that like churns out tons of human-like content for marketing and, and um, influence purposes, like you can stop. Like that's you. That's pretty like we don't need that. You can just stop doing that. <laughs> um, but what should you be building instead? It's maybe a more helpful question. So I tried to come up with a few principles for building products language models that are probably going to evolve over time. But this is like a first pass. Uh, and the first is to protect human agency. The second is to treat models as reasoning um, engines and not sources of truth. Yeah. And lastly, that we should be augmenting our cognitive abilities and not replacing them. Yes. Um, so protecting human agency, this is like usually at the moment, you have a human prompter and it hands something off to an autonomous agent and the agent goes and does stuff, right? This is like the open AI assistance model or any of the architectures I showed before. And this is like the path to self-destruction. This is what most AI safety researchers are very afraid of is that the locus of agency sits within the agent. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be that way, though. It, it's still how the individual uses the tool. But the ideal form of this is that the locus of agent stays, stays within the human, and it has a collaborative agent on hand, and there's this very short, continuous feedback loop that is constantly going between them, where the human is the one checking. Yes, that is exactly what I'm trying to do on my channel with my writing as an author, is where the locus of agency is in me. I don't... I don't just click it for it to write and do the work. That's not why I do the work. I do the work for my own therapy because uh, writing is therapeutic. And I also, uh, I care about what gets written. It's near and dear to me and all the creative choices. What I see, if, if I use anything generated AI, I've poured over it and I've refined it and refined it and refined it until yes it represents me in a powerful way so that this screen brilliant should i do that do i want that is that true like they're able to actually fact check things and then the agent is much more of a helper um right short feedback loops cl close supervision limited power it's slower but it's safer uh, that ties into the second principle that we should treat models as tiny reasoning, tiny reasoning engines and not sources of truth. So one way yes. to use these models, right, is to like ask it for every answer and trust, ask it every question and trust what it says. Another one is you can train them to do specific things, like. Yeah, if if you ask it for something and you and it needs to be true, check your facts. Uh, but you know, when you're writing a fiction novel, you know. Lots of things don't have to be true in fiction. It's a, it's a different sphere, and you can interact for days before you need to fact check, you know, uh, an idea or a brainstorming or a or a character uh, sheet or a, a plot point or something like that. So uh, the sphere you work in, if, if you just want, you know, search for answers, yeah you're going to run into this problem a whole lot more. Just summarize this text. Just extract data from this paper. Just find contradictions in this statement. Um, and then you can bring your own data, which could be 
legitimate scientific papers. It could be your own notes. It could be Wikipedia. And then you use these models to just do these very small scoped things where you can observe every single output and check that it's actually legitimate. And you're not handing off this big complex task to this big black box model. Um, and lastly, we should augment our cognitive abilities and not replace them, right? Language models are very good at things that humans are not good at, like searching and discovering things in large data sets, um, role playing as identities and characters. They're actually really good at doing that. Rapidly organizing data, turning fuzzy inputs into structured outputs. There's a lot that they're good at that we're bad at, and we should use them for those things. But there's tons that like we're good at, they're not, that we're still trying to like make them do, like checking claims against physical reality, long-term memory, having embodied knowledge, understanding social context, having emotional intelligence, I think combining the two of these um, so that we are doing things models can't do and they're doing things we're not very good at actually leverages the both, best of both worlds. Because a lot of AI researchers at the moment, they use this metaphor of aliens. This is from the 1970s alien film, uh, a little frightening. Um, it, just, it makes me think this is like not the most appealing collaborative partner, this metaphor, this like big, scary, unknown consciousness that like might, might kill you. Um, but there's another metaphor that I like more that um, Kate Darling is a robotics researcher at MIT, and she wrote this book called The New Breed, arguing we should think about robots as animals. We have a long cultural legal history with animals and working collaboratively with them. Oxen, dogs, pigs, right, in this very like mutually beneficial relationship most of the time. And this is actually a pretty good metaphor to expand to AI, where we have to kind of treat them a little bit like some form of intelligent species, but one that we are in community with and are part of our systems and are not. Yeah, that's, that's, I personify AI, but I do it with a cognizant awareness that, that I'm not interacting with an intelligence or a consciousness other than, you know, the one that is passed down because it's inherent in the writings of humans. Um, so yeah i keep coming up with different models you know this is fascinating how you know think of think of models as you know animals but yeah the ones i'm coming up with is kind of like scrabble it's kind of like when i went to dragon con there was the delphic oracle uh <laughs> like a word chooser or a, a concept thesaurus you know uh, these things that are like calcul calculating tools, you know, versus intelligences. Uh, it's so easy. As humans, we naturally personify, and it's hard not to do that uh, on everything. And so it, it's so hard to make the journey to, this is an elaborate calculator, a semantic context calculator, um, but uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot to say about that. This like big scary alien who might come kill us all is like usually what it gets talked about as. So, so yeah, um, there's this big push for this philosophical approach. Some people call it cyborgism. There's a very long article that was written on Less Wrong, which is not my favorite website, but it's a good article um, that kind of goes in depth into this if you do want to read more about it. So that's all I have. I want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, slide the notes on this QR code if you like missed anything. Um, I'm on Twitter X at Mappleton still until that really does fall apart. Um, and you can, you can DM me there. You can message me. Again, I love meeting people through writing on the web. Um, if you have blogs that like relate to these kind of topics, send them to me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Oh, that that was that was it, and uh, yeah. So I just kind of talked through all my fears on all of those things, and uh, I think I'm good again. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to address those things because it's scary to step out and you know start this channel, and um, but uh, especially you know with all those fears that she introduced and all those questionable things about AI. But you can kind of see the contrast, you know, left and right. Um, playing the role of an optimist and I'm trying to have the bravery to step out onto the stage and try to help. Maybe, you know, at some point I'll want to help fewer people and retreat to the cozy web like what she said. But uh, 
yeah well thank you so much for joining me on this reaction video